to introduce uh, again yet another one of our outstanding chief residents, Alicia Fingrich. Um, I think in many respects she needs no introduction, but uh, she uh, has a remarkable background worth re repeating and reminding us all of. She graduated from uh, Johns Hopkins uh, before she uh, actually enlisted in the Army, where she was in the 82nd Airborne uh, for and uh, was in the Army for six years. She received multiple medals during her time, including a combat action, a brown star, and uh, most impressively to most of us, uh, her parachute badge. <laughs> she uh, then went home, back to KU for medical school, and uh, we were fortunate enough to recruit her here to UC Davis, where during her uh, professional development year, she uh, received a Master's of Science in Integrative Genetics and Genomics as part of the a data a biology lab on the main campus and has uh, received multiple awards and presentations during her uh, time uh, here at UC Davis. She uh, has made us all proud by matching at MD Anderson where she's going to go on to do her uh, surgical oncology fellowship and we are excited to hear about Beds, bite, from bite to bedside this morning. Uh, Dr. Gingrich, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Farmer, for that kind introduction, and I appreciate that you're here with us this morning. Um, this, I can't believe this talk is here. I feel like I was just watching Aaron Brown, and it's unbelievable how fast the past seven years have gone. So thank you to everyone joining um, in person and virtually this morning. Um, I'm excited to speak with you. Uh, I have no disclosures for any of these uh, topics or presentations I'm going to cover, although I do have involvement in some of them, and all of data has been shared, shared with uh, permission from the authors. So surgery and genomics, perhaps an unlikely pairing on the surface, but we are actually seeing a meteoric rise of genomic data across fields of surgery. And I know I'm going to be a cancer doctor, but we're not just seeing this for cancer applications. Um, such as for the development of targeted therapy. We're also seeing genomic studies in terms of understanding inflammation and immunity, reactions to trauma and stress, pediatric development, and the microbiome, and even cultural considerations. And most importantly, we're not just seeing the rise of this data in our journals. We're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it out in society. And you'll note that this headline does not say that genetic counselors thinks patients need genetic testing. It doesn't say that the medical oncologist thinks that. It says surgeons. And despite the fact that most of us have very little formal genetic and genomic training in our education, our profession is inherent with the responsibility to knowing these things that are going to affect our patient care. You'll hear Dr. Bull harp that surgeons are not just technicians, and it's for reasons like this we owe our patients explanations to the studies that are driving their care. But this is a young field, it's 20 years old, and so when many of us left undergrad, myself included, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today hadn't been discovered yet, and that was a big part of the reason why I asked to go back to school during my professional development years, and what I hope to cover with you all today. Uh, so we're going to go uh, through a bit of an agenda. I'm going to talk about my background and what led me to this. Uh, through the history of genomic data, how we approach it, its influence, and then this concept of making data fair, which I'll talk about later. Uh, so Dr. Farmer, thank you for the kind introduction. She touched on my background. Um, I was raised um, the child of two parents in the Air Force, and I really share this slide just to mention that at seven years, Sacramento was the longest I've ever lived anywhere, um, and it will always have a special place in my heart for that reason. Um, for college, I did go on to Johns Hopkins, where I uh, paid for that with an Army ROTC scholarship. Um, I was getting set to graduate in 2006 uh, and was supposed to go to medical school. Um, as many of you remember, that was in the thick of the Iraq War, and uh, George W. Bush had just coined the term surging, and it just didn't quite feel right to go to medical school at that point, so I decided to go on to active duty instead. Um, so I submitted my paperwork for active duty, and the Army came back, and they said, great, you are going to be a signal officer, which is someone who's in charge of pushing 
data across different mediums, computers, radios, satellite links, the like. And they said, you're going to the 82nd Airborne Division. And I actually appealed this decision because I had not taken a single computer class in all of college. And I have a petrified, I'm pathologically afraid of heights. <laughs> so uh, I entered uh, my time on active duty with some trepidation. <clears throat> uh, but the Army does train you. So they sent me to six months uh, worth of an officer basic course. Um, and I learned how to put together a data network. Um, this truck and satellite trailer uh, is a representative snapshot of the piece of equipment I used to run. Inside are a bunch of routers and switches um, and things that enable communication from up and down the satellite and then pushing out to the individual user terminals at our unit. Um, I had about 50 soldiers underneath me that were in charge of all the bits and pieces and together we coordinated the our architecture of the network so that units could talk among the battlefield and then also back to the United States. And I did learn how to jump out of a plane. I did it 16 times. <sighs> After this training, the Army sent me on two deployments to Iraq. Uh, the first one was to Tikrit. The second one was to Baghdad. Yes, that is me. And yes, Dr. Salcedo, I've been toning it down for the past seven years. <laughs> So the Army taught me a lot of things. It taught me also how to be brave. It taught me how to be brave this way. It taught me how to be brave this way. And it taught me how to be brave this way. And as it turns out, this third skill really comes in handy in residency. <laughs> and you'll be surprised if you're willing to be brave enough to suck at something new, the opportunities that are going to come your way. So we're going to fast forward a few years, and I was at the SSO in 2017 with Dr. Cantor, and we sat listening to one of the plenary presentations uh, entitled, Predicting Colorectal Cancer Recurrence by Utilizing Multiple View, Multiple Learner, Supervised Learning. This talk was by Jason Castellanos, who was uh, getting his uh, bioinformatics degree at Vanderbilt at the time. He went on to Memorial Sloan Kettering and is now faculty at Fox Chase teaching Jennifer Olson, and I got to meet him uh, out on the campaign, or on the interview trail. Uh, so I re what I remember from this talk is that it was beautiful, and it contained a lot of really great data. And at the end of the talk, he had his slide for questions, and he said, did anyone have any questions? And there was dead silence in the auditorium, because no one really knew what to ask. And it was at this point that Dr. Cantor leaned over, and he said, you understand computers, right? You need to learn that. And I said, this sounds like another opportunity to suck at something new. <laughs> so I did. Um, I, as Dr. Farmer mentioned, my professional development years were spent uh, in the Integrative Genetics and Genomics graduate group, um, earning my master's in science out here at, at UC Davis. Um, my I had two PIs, Dr. Cantor was one. Uh, this is Titus Brown, and he has a background and a PhD in computer science, and is actually on the call this morning. Thank you, Titus. Um, I had a wonderful two years in his lab that I'm gonna, sh some of which I'm gonna share with you today. Um, he runs the lab for data intensive biology, which has close ties to both the UC Davis Genome Center um, and the data lab, which is out at the main uh, campus. <clears throat> So now you know how I got here. Let me update you on where we've come in the past 20 years to get you to the state of genomic medicine today. Many of you have heard of the Human Genome product, Project. It was first conceptualized in 1988, uh, and it took about 15 years to complete. And this was an international consortium that came together that wanted to sequence the entire human genome for the first time. Um, and it took a long time, really, because our technology was in its infancy, but it was capable of the project with the right amount of collaboration and the right amount of patience. I do want to point out that in 1999, um, the consortium not only backed the rapid construction of a working draft, but they also stood firm on open data access, which was a decision with implications that has rever reverberated into the future that I'll talk about later. Uh, it took us until 1999 to decode the first human chromosome, 
And then the first initial draft sequence was published two years later in 2001. And this picture here is actually a bookshelf. They printed out the entire code the first time they discovered it, which I just thought was really charming. So what did we learn from the Human Genome Project? So first of all, we took, quote, several volunteers from a, quote, diverse population. All of the data that went into the making the Human Genome Project has been de-identified. It's thought to be from a mix of men and women. Uh, but the diverse population piece is something that's been called into question in revisions of the genome. Uh, our genome has 3.1 billion base pairs. And in 2001, when they declared they had finished it, uh, it was said to, to be 99% at 99.9% .9 accuracy. But this is something that you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with data and with bases on this scale. That left 31 million base pairs unmapped. The average length of the human gene is about 250 base pairs. So when we said we were 99% done, there's just a big significant digits conversion you need to respect in that declaration. But we did find 22,000 protein coding genes uh, and millions of polymorphisms, which are differences from one person to the other. Uh, the Human Genome Project spun off several other projects. The first is the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, hosts the Genome Browser. And basically, our entire genome is now online, the humans and many other species. I've clicked on the dog icon more times than I want to admit. Um, and as you can see over here, we are actually on version 38 of the genome at, in, at this point. So here's a representative screenshot looking at Dr. Cantor's favorite gene, Tigit. Um, and you can run different tracks on the genome. And it'll tell you that it's on chromosome 3 um, in region 13 of the Q arm. And you can layer things on here like different species, um, gene expression data in different tissues, things like that. I've actually taken a three-day course on the genome browser, and I still feel like I've barely tapped into everything it can do. The folks at Santa Cruz are wholly committed to keeping this thing running, current, and um, useful to the, to the researcher. There are a couple other projects that took place, too. Uh, the Thousand Genomes Project um, uh, sort of happened as a reaction to realizing that our first draft wasn't as diverse as we thought it may be, and they went out of their way to seque sequence 1,000 genomes from around the world from many diff different ethnicities. The 100,000 Genomes Project was an initiative led by the NHS in England to specifically sequence people with rare uh, diseases and rare cancers. The Human Microbiome Project, which I'll touch on a bit later, as well as the Cancer Genome Atlas. So this is the requisite slide that really belongs in every genomics presentation, and this explains why there's been such a meteoric rise in this type of data. When we first sequenced uh, the genome, it cost $100 million, um, or upwards of $100 million. Around 2007, 2008, uh, next generation sequencing kicked in, and the cost of sequencing the genome dropped rapidly. So now it's affordable for researchers to sequence their own data, and it, they're doing so at a rapid rate, and we'll talk about what that means. I wanted to walk through briefly some of the different technologies we use to sequence data to give you an understanding of their capabilities and limitations. So the first generation is called Sanger sequencing. And I'm sharing this with you because this is how the Human Genome Project was sequenced. And it also remains the gold standard to sort of validate any sequencing done today. Um, it's a slow method. Uh, you take your DNA, you unwind it, and then you attach a primer for that five prime to three prime synthesis. Um, you then break your sample into four test tubes, and these four test tubes correspond to the G, A, T, and C bases. Um, and then you initiate a reaction that allows for synthesis of DNA. Um, in these test tubes, they contain special versions of the bases called dideoxynucleotides, which terminate the DNA synthesis at that leading, at that three prime end. And so you know what base it terminates on. And then you run these samples on gel electrophoresis. If it sounds laborious and time intensive, it is, but it's highly accurate. 
Um, you can see that the read length here is about 400 to 900 base pairs, and you get 96 to 384 reads per run. So this is a plate-based sort of method. Illumina is the method that really dropped the costs for a lot of the sequencing, um, and despite being second generation, this is used prolifically. You can get this incredibly inexpensively at our genome center here at Davis. Um, this method uses, uses, again, purified DNA, which is fragmented into small pieces. The pieces are then given adapters, which act as reference points during amplification, sequencing, and analysis. Um, the modified DNA is then loaded onto a chip, which is anchored by thousands of oligonucleotides, and then this is expanded into clusters. Um, after each round of synthesis, the camera takes a picture of a chip, and a computer determines what base was added based on a wavelength. So by using this method, thousands of places throughout the genome or transcriptome are sequenced at once in a massively parallel fashion, because you're getting a read that's off that chip. And then finally, third generation or long read sequencing. Um, so this enables reads for up to 100 kilobase pairs. You'll notice that Illumina, its max is 300 base pairs. So long read sequencing has really come into play um, when doing reference genome construction now, and they're layering a lot of these um, technologies together. Um, but this one, you take your double strand of DNA, you put primers on the end of it. This turns the DNA into a circle. And the polymerase travels around and around and around the circle several times, reading the sequence over and over again. And then what you're left with for analysis is a um, composite sort of consensus sequence. Um, there's that 99.9% .9 accuracy again, but it is pretty good. Um, and gaps are often filled in with Sanger sequencing or Illumina. In the past uh, seven or so years, there's been a huge rise in single cell sequencing. So all of the messes I've talked so far, you take a bulk amount of cells, which we all know one cell isn't necessarily identical to its neighbor. Single cell sequencing enables us um, to separate the signals and really get down to a granular level of cellular expression data. So this technique relies a lot on um, <clears throat> microfluidics, and cells are put into a bead with specific barcodes and adapters and then sequenced on their own. <clears throat> and I'll touch on some of this granular data later. I do want to give a quick word on microarrays. So when I showed you the graph of the plummeting costs of sequencing, there's a time frame in there uh, from 2005 to 2010 or so where next generation sequencing wasn't readily available, but the interest in genomic papers were there. And what a lot of people used to publish that data are microarrays. Microarrays work by you select genes to put on this chip, so 384 genes or so, and then you see if your sample um, reflects that gene expression, has mutations, et cetera. You can use it for either DNA or RNA. Um, I think this is great in the validated setting, such as we use this type of technology when we're looking for birth defects um, in children um, and in places where your gene set and the genes you've chosen have been validated. In a lot of those 2005 to 2010 papers, this is used, being used as a discovery-based method, and I think it's easy to see the selection bias that that can be a problem. Um, so it's one of those technologies that has come out where it has its place and it has its application, not always what it's used for. Okay. This is a trick I got from Dr. Bold. He used it a few years ago. When you're giving a really dense talk, you break it up with a pretty picture. <laughs> gives everyone mind a break and brings them back to you. So uh, if any of the interns haven't gotten to Yosemite yet, you should. All right, let's talk about how to approach genomic data, because this is definitely something we haven't been taught um, in medical school. So it's not uncommon to open up a paper that references genomic data, and you see figures like this. And even my mind scrambles and gets reeling until I can anchor on something that I understand. And also, for the, how authors arrive at these, um, it's kind of a black box for a lot of us. So this is your machine learning system. Yeah, you just pour the data onto this big pile of linear algebra and then collect answers on the other side. Well, what if the answers are wrong? You just stir the pile till they start looking right. And, and that makes all of us nervous. <laughs> and it's important to understand that all major genomic breakthroughs so far 
in terms of sequencing have been accompanied by the development of groundbreaking st statistical and computational methods. And learning those methods, or at least having a working understanding of their application, is just as important as understanding where your data is coming from. Um, so this was one of my professors in graduate school that some of you may know. This is Wolf Heyer. He um, is the microbiology and molecular genetics chair. Um, and he taught our molecular genetics seminar. And he is a very, very smart man. Um, and when he gave us this look, we actually knew to proceed with caution. We'd often be discussing papers or what experiment we would do next. And you knew the words that were coming out of his mouth next were that this is not a fishing expedition. The omics, without a question, is useless. So you can't just take your linear algebra and stir it around with whatever samples you want. The design and analysis of your studies needs to be very carefully thought through. So we'll go through some of that now. The bottom line, and thank you, Dr. Calcutt, for this, <laughs> is you need to ask the right question the right way with the right data. So when I'm approaching genomic studies, here are some of the questions I ask myself. When was this paper written? What technology was available at that time? Where does this data come from? Mice, humans, patients, PDX models? How did we make it? What was the author's question? What analyses did they do? How are the results displayed? What are the limitations of this study? Were the results validated? Are we just looking at associations, or did we follow up with a functional study that may represent causation? And are the conclusions relevant to my patients? I want to say a quick word on two terms that you'll hear a lot, which are dimensionality reduction and data visualization. These could be separate graduate degrees in and of themselves. Um, but the concept is that when you're taking data that's this big and you're taking high-level data, it needs to go through math to reduce it into something that's meaningful. Then that math needs to be represented as a picture our brains can interpret. And this can be done really well, and it can be done really poorly. And the techniques people use to do either of these steps can have implications on our interpretations of the data, which isn't just what are we going to publish in a paper, it's what decision am I going to make for my patient. And so I think it's really important that we understand some of this. I think one of the classic examples that confuses people um, is so-called TISNI, or this T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. It's hard to pick up a sequencing paper these days without seeing a TISNI plot. But what if I told you that each of these plots was using the exact same set of data, and it was just a different way that they set up their computation? Different um, conclusions can be drawn, really, from each of these pictures, and that gets confusing. And what you should know is that TISNI is an unsupervised nonlinear technique. It, it specializes in preserving similarities as opposed to other methods such as principal component analysis, which maximize variance. It produces plots which display clusters. But the clusters are strongly influenced by chosen parameters. Um, and you can really change how your TISNI looks based on the, uh, what you input to your model. TISNI is really just meant to give you a feel of how the data is arranging itself in high dimensional space. So if I see a paper and the TISNI is their first figure and they go on to dive into that TISNI better with functional studies, I feel better. If the TISNI is the last figure leading into the bottom line of their results, I'm suspicious. So I just wanted to take a couple of slides to talk about times when we've changed our approach to data. Um, in terms of the analysis we chose to do and where it got us. So my thesis project was studying uh, the transcriptome of canine natural killer cells in response to various um, immunotherapies uh, with Dr. Cantor's lab. Um, so we did some bulk RNA sequencing, and I ran a principal component analysis on my data. So the yellow and the green here are two uh, resting uh, populations of cells in their steady state um, derived from two different surface markers. And we found when we put them in the same um, co-culture sort of expansion conditions, they converged onto one phenotype. And this was pretty exci a pretty exciting finding for us. Um, so we decided to repeat the experiment at the single cell level to sort of get down to that granularity I was talking about earlier. And I was so excited. I was like, this is it. I'm going to make my first TISNI. 
This is pretty lousy Disney, to be honest. It doesn't really show that granular data I was looking for. It basically tells me that I have two resting populations with a lot of similarities, because that's what a Tisney tells you is similarity, and two activated populations with a lot of similarities. Uh, and this was one of those moments where I was kind of stuck. Um, and I know many of us have heard Dr. Farber and Dr. Holcroft say that you should never be the smartest person in the room or you're in the wrong room. And luckily my lab was full of brilliant people. So I turned to uh, the woman sitting next to me and showed her my results. And she says, let's try a different technique. Let's try diffusion mapping. Uh, diffusion mapping is um, it's an, it's another dimensionality reduction method that uses eigenvectors and eigenvalues to uh, set a Euclidean diffusion distance, meaning that the distance in your points is actually something quantitative that you can rely on and not a vague set of clustering. And I said, okay, let's find some code, let's try this. And what I got with this was a really nice graph that had me really excited. Um, so what you see here um, is a resting population of cells um, with very little variance, which is not surprising, because if you're looking for RNA transcription in a resting cell population, that mRNA isn't actually super active. And as we activated the cells, we got this really nice um, arc. And so then we decided to dive into this a little bit more. Uh, we looked for breakpoints in our arc here, um, and then did differential gene expression between each of these clusters. And what we were able to describe was a gene activation sequence taking the cells from a resting state to their state of sort of max activation. And this is really cool in the dog population. For mice and for humans, their NK cells, we know. We understand. We know there's five to six stages of development depending on the species. This hasn't been talked about in dogs yet. So the fact that just by changing how we were approaching our analysis, we got some answers. This was a pretty exciting moment. The next example I'm going to give is one from the lab that I was peripherally involved in. Uh, this is Dr. Taylor Ryder. Um, she's a bioinformatician that graduated from Titus's lab earlier this year. Um, and she does a lot of metagenomic analysis. So metagenomic analysis is when you're taking a lot of different populations, pr principally bacteria, and sequencing them all together. Um, the classic way to do this is a way called reference space, where you map everything, all of the bacteria genomes, back to their reference genomes. Um, and we've done this a lot on the human microbiome. Um, what I'd like to draw your attention to is this green circle, where it says that only 80% of the human microbiome metagenome is mappable. What does that mean? It means we sequence all these bacteria, we take reads, some map to a reference, some don't. Some get sent to downstream analysis, some don't. And this graphic says it's 80%. In some studies, it's almost as high as 40%. And just to be clear, that's 40% of your data getting thrown away, and you're proceeding with 60 into your microbiome analysis, which for most of us isn't good enough. So Titus and Taylor said, we think we have another way to do this. We think we have a way to make this better. Um, and they're very smart people. They used a method called um, assembly graphs, which looks at all of the genomes you're inputting and through, again, a lot of linear algebra, finds a lot of nearest neighbors. And the amount of data they lost was a lot less, um, to the point that Taylor realized she couldn't just tell the difference now in a microbiome analysis between different species, but she could tell the difference between different strains. Other, another name for a strain is a clade or a subspecies. So she's getting to an even finer level of detail using her assembly graph method. And since we're a multidisciplinary lab, we were again having a conversation one day and she said, I think I have a method that can look more granularly at a microbiome. What should, what should we apply this to? And I said, I know. <laughs> so we decided to look at IBD. Uh, and just Taylor didn't need to go get any of her own data. The Human Microbiome Project publishes this for free, as well as many other studies. So she took, I think it was six sets of data, um, and ran it through her assembly graph pipeline. Um, and then she was able to make some interesting um, discoveries um, that both sort of validated her method and gave us some new information. 
So she noticed in Crohn's disease, this was characterized by a loss of diversity. And this is what previous methods using reference-based analysis had shown as well. So that's a good internal validation. And then she noticed for five species, portions of their genomes became more abundant while portions became less abundant. And this is evidence of that strain switching. So while the species variation wasn't changing, her method captured that the strain variation was. One of these bugs, Rheumococcus navis, has been implicated in the literature as a culprit for Crohn's disease before, and she found that in her data as well. But she also found four additional strains um, with significant variation in Crohn's disease. Um, she hasn't published this yet. This is all on her GitHub um, at that link there. But we hope that it's coming soon to a journal near you. Another mind break. We're going to switch gears again. Where's that? <laughs> oh, this is Big Sur. You can see Bixby Bridge uh, over here, kind of in the background behind this corner. Also a must. All right, but this is a talk for surgeons, and we need to talk about some of the influences of genomic data in surgery. And I think what's most important to the surgeons isn't really always the method. I'm not going to become a software developer anytime soon. But it's applying the methods that exist to the right question, the questions that actually help our patients. And so I've got two really nice examples that I wanted to go through um, to illustrate this point. Uh, this is Dr. Jen Jen Ye. She is a surgeon scientist at the University of North Carolina um, and an absolutely brilliant researcher. Um, she studies pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And back in 2015, she noticed that um, a lot of the sequencing papers for PDAC were done sort of with these bulk RNA sam samples. And in 2015, looking at the year of her paper again, this really predated the rise of single cell sequencing. And so she said, you know, I think we're putting garbage in, and I think we're getting garbage out. We're putting in this really heterogeneous group of cells and wondering why we don't see a genetic sim uh, signal for PDAC. Um, <clears throat> so her solution was with her bioinformaticians. She used a different technique um, math-wise that performed sort of a virtual dissection of her biological data, and it separated really the cancer cells from the stromal cells from the hepatocytes, et cetera, et cetera. And so this resulted in this sort of in silico separation of these components, which I think was a really smart move on her part. And I also think it really took somebody who has taken pancreatic cancer out of people to see that the approach was wrong and to see that all of these tissues were actually mingling together in all of the other papers she had read. So what did she find? Um, so this is a heat map. They're also in most um, genomic studies. In this case, the red color are induced genes. Blue are repressed. We don't actually say up and down regulated. That's a bad colloquialism. <clears throat> Basically, once Dr. Ye separated all of the components of PDAC, she was able to find two subtypes, a classical subtype and this other subtype she describes as basal cell. And a lot of the basal cell mutations um, share, uh, are similar to that of triple negative breast cancer. And she found that the basal-like type had an inferior survival. And then she did something I mentioned earlier which was she took her findings and she validated them on an external data set that she didn't sequence on her own. She applied the same virtual microdissection and found the same thing in this open data. And then again, since she's, since she's a surgeon, she said, what does this actually mean for my patients? She found that the basal type in the middle was more likely to have a survival advantage with chemotherapy, while the classical type was not. And then on the far right there, the multicolored graph she noted that the survival in the basal and classical um, forms of PDAC was inferior for African-American patients than for those um, Caucasians. And these are the last sort of figures in her paper that I think if a clinician hadn't been involved, we wouldn't have taken the steps to kind of figure out. The next paper I want to talk about is from Dr. Carvajal Carmona. He's another professor here at UC Davis, and he specializes on studying cancers in Latinos. He took a look at the Cancer Genome Atlas, <clears throat> and he realized something really interesting, that in spite of the fact that this is a robust atlas from, collect, with, with data collected from multi-institutions that had gone through a rigorous vetting process, 
the ethnic composition doesn't exactly make up that of what we see in America. And in particular, Latinos are very underrepresented. And he said, I think this is a problem. In 2014, based on a TCGA study, uh, subtypes, molecular subtypes of gastric cancer were introduced. Um, EBV, microsatellite, uh, genomically stable, and chromosome unstable. And these are sort of the proportions that the TCGA published as prevalent in the overall population. And Dr. Carvajal Carmona said, you know, actually, if you look at Latinos, our percentages are vastly different. Most importantly, this low percentage of microsatellite unstable tumors is only 8% in Latinos, and that has significant implications on whether they're candidates for checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, so this is, a, this is a real thing you need to consider. So uh, at this point, Dr. Carvajal Carmona said he was going to do his own study, and he performed whole exome sequencing of um, Latino patients with familial gastric cancer. And we all know the familial gastric cancer gene, CDH1, it's been on the ab site for the last seven years. And that's not what he found. He found that in Latinos, it's this gene called PALB2. Um, it's one of the genes involved in homologous recombination, just like BRCA1 and BRCA2. And he went on to validate this in follow-up studies. And it's now recognized as a familial cancer gene specific in patients with Latino ancestry. Um, and again, I just think that's a way that people involved in medicine look at the data that other people aren't going to. Lake Tahoe. The last section of my talk is going to be about making data fair. And I'll tell you what that means. It's a really important concept that massive data doesn't equal usable data. There can be a lot of data out there. It doesn't mean that we can access it in a meaningful way. So the Sequence Read Archive uh, is the largest publicly available data repository of high throughput sequencing data. And this archive accepts data from all branches of life, as well as metagenomic and environmental studies. It has 43 petabytes of data and counting. What's a petabyte? A petabyte is 1,000 terabytes. For the Gen Xers in the audience, that's over 22,000 high quality DVD movies. And for the millennials in the audience, Facebook's pictures take up 1.8 petabytes of storage space. 43 petabytes of genomic data are sitting out there, theoretically accessible to all of us, if we can get to them. Now, I have personally tried to download data from the SRA. It is challenging. There's a lot of code involved. It doesn't work. You have all these bugs. It's actually much easier to get it from a European source. It's fraught with problems. So the fact that all of this data is technically out there and technically available doesn't actually mean it's accessible. What are we going to do about this? So in March of 2016, a consortium published this concept in the Journal of Scientific Data that says, yeah, data is massive, but we need to make data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, that paper came out about five years ago, and we are inching our way towards these goals. Um, and this really has its roots in 1996 during the Human Genome Project. Um, a bunch of the researchers got together and they laid out something called the Bermuda Principles, which was all parties agreeing to make the human genome sequences available in public databases, ideally within 24 hours, no delays, no exceptions. And this is really on the premise that this data belongs to all of us. However, this data is also sensitive. It comes from patients. It belongs to people. And especially when you're correlating it with clinical data, which is how we get our outcomes, it needs to be protected. So all of these organizations and universities, while they were building their data, had to put protections on it. And these, um, these programs in the repositories don't necessarily crosstalk. So we have a real Tower of Babel situation going on in, um, in the world of data. So let's ask some questions. And these aren't mine. I'll tell you who these are. Wouldn't it be cool if you could search data first? Instead of reading through a bunch of papers, trying to find their data availability statement, going to their NCBI link, figuring out if it's that, that's the right study for you, if you could just search data first, that would then point you in the right direction. Wouldn't it be great if you could search across different data sets without the Tower of Babel, even if they use slightly different terms? 
What if you could tell instantly what format and file types the data were in? And this is a big difference when you're talking DNA versus RNA versus epigenetics, what kind of data you're looking for. And wouldn't it be great to access all the data the same way, no matter where it lives on the internet? So these are some of the goals of the Common Fund Data Ecosystem. And this is run uh, out of Titus Brown's lab. It's, this is a project that's about two years old. Um, the project manager is an absolutely brilliant woman named Dr. Amanda Charbonneau and her team listed here. Uh, so what this team has tirelessly been doing for the past two years is trying to make some of these questions come true. Um, and what they've done is they've wrangled some common fund programs which are funded by the NIH and they're saying, let's make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable underneath this umbrella of the common fund data ecosystem. So when Amanda tells this story, she says, oops, she says, oh, I talked to some programs and I got them to make their metadata all the same and I put it into a model. And the Herculean effort that she is downplaying there is just one that can't be understated. She's been working really hard with all of these programs to get them to standardize their data frames um, and get them into a model that we can search um, or a portal that we can search. Um, and then here's a basic sort of flow of what this looks like um, as the data gets from the programs into the CFD catalog. And now it's just what she has, she and her team have created are a common fund data ecosystem research portal. Um, this actually just went live last week um, and I attended a workshop on it. It was really interesting. The, uh, the URL is here. Um, it contains over three, three million files from almost two million bio samples. And you can search it easily, just the way you would search the internet. It's very intuitive. Um, you can look at tissue types across different studies for RNA data, DNA, um, xRNA, metabolomics. Um, and it really is comprehensive and comes together. Um, like I said, this portal just went live last week. We're 20 years out from sequencing the genome, and we're just starting to attack these questions. So I'm really excited to see where this goes and see what this team can do. Um, if anyone's super motivated after this talk, they have more training coming up in April. Um, and all of their contact information and their preprint is listed here, and I'm happy to share. To conclude, I want to focus on one program from within the CFDE, and this is the Gabriella Miller Kids First uh, Pediatric Research Program. So Gabriella is a 10-year-old that died of DIPG back in 2013. Um, before she died, as she lived with her diagnosis, she was a huge access for pediatric, um, or she, huge advocate for access to pediatric genomic data to study cancers. Um, and the Gabriella Miller Kids First Research Act actually authorized $126 million to the NIH over 10 years and was funded from Congress because of this 10-year-old. Um, so this database currently has 30 studies um, from tens of thousands of families and has 131,000 files. And they've got some goals, that their patients are really their partners to get genomic big data out there, that it stays safe and secure. And this is all in the goal of a precision approach to these rare childhood cancers and childhood diseases. Um, the, DRC is run by this man named Dr. Adam Resnick, who's incredibly charismatic, but also um, really believes in making data not just technically accessible, but intellectually accessible to clinicians. And when you hear him speak on this subject, he always ends with that we have a moral imperative to get this data into the hands of clinicians. Sequencing data can't just stay with the bioinformaticians. It needs to be applied, and that's really what he's behind. So how have they done this? So those 131,000 files are available on the Kids First um, research portal. And not only that, you can push them to a, um, a thing called Cavatica, which is hosted on Amazon Web Services, and it enables web-based analysis of your data. So when you go to analyze data, you need compute space, um, which is just raw technology from a computer, CPUs and such. Um, and that's what Amazon Web Services is, provides. Cavatica is also taking the coding out of it. So instead of needing to know how to sit there and write code, as long as you know the steps of your analysis you want to do, you can drag and drop these graphics to build a pipeline. 
So you, on Kids First, you select your files, you push them to Cavatica, you build your pipeline, and you get an analysis out on the other side. And the whole goal is to lower the learning curve and lower the thresholds for the clinicians to interact with this data themselves. Kids First funds projects through X01 grants. So you submit it for an X01 grant. If you're awarded, they will sequence your data for you. It is yours and yours alone for six months. You can do your analysis on Cavatica or with a bioinformatician. And then it gets released onto the Kids First portal for others to use. And some of the representative studies are here. So in conclusion, I know better than to embed a video in a PowerPoint. Let me just drag this over here. This is Gabriella Miller. So what message do you have to our political leaders, our elected leaders, about kids? Like Stop talking and start doing. And then she laughs for about a minute because she knows she said a bad word. <laughs> Bodega Bay. So if this talk has interested you at all, if you feel called to action, if you feel like you want to be brave enough to suck at something new, especially the junior residents, let me just assure you that this field is wide open and we need clinical bioinformaticians, that's what I've titled myself, um, to help move this field forward. Before I take questions, I'd like to give some acknowledgments to people who've been just instrumental in my life along the way. To Titus and Taylor and the rest of the Dib Lab, you will forever have a special place in my heart. Um, I never got a lab photo before COVID shut us down. <laughs> I have this photo from our summer institute where we were, it's a two week intensive where the lab comes together as an effort to teach people basic um, bioinformatics <laughs> skills. Um, and it was just a really rewarding experience. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my co-residents who've been there for me in every way along the way, especially Amanda, who's basically my personal therapist at this point. Um, I tell the applicants every year that when you choose a residency, you're choosing a family, and I couldn't be happier with mine. I'd like to thank the faculty, especially Dr. Farmer, for all of the support she's given me over the years. I'd like to thank my two program directors, uh, Dr. Galante, for choosing my application out of I don't know how many and giving me a chance to be here. And Dr. Salcedo, thanks for putting up with me, <laughs> especially this year. Um, I went to put individual pictures of the faculty members I wanted to thank and realized there were just so many. If there's a piece of advice I could give the junior residents is you don't just need mentors in your specialty. There are so many wonderful faculty members here that teach me so many things. Um, Dr. Calcutt, who contributed to this talk, Dr. Zach Luzny and Rinder Connect. I know you're sitting here and you probably think that's why I'm saying your names, but I was gonna thank you anyway. Um, Dr. Hirose and Aaron Brown um, from the Pediatric Division. Dr. Kokenauer for walking me through my first major complication. And there's just so many of you, but I've really been grateful to all the time and attention you've given me over the years. I'd like to thank the surgical oncology faculty in particular, uh, including Dr. Connie while she was with us. Um, I showed up wanting to do surgonc and kind of pretended to be interested in other things for a while, but I knew where my heart was. I think they knew it too. Um, they've just been so supportive of me from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, in, in, in every way, Dr. Galami talking to, I think, every program imaginable while I was interviewing, um, Dr. Campbell giving me publishing me opportunities, Dr. Souter, Dr. Bold's mentorship as well. I'm just very, very grateful. Uh, my main mentor has been Dr. Cantor, and I really hoped he had to leave, but I really hope he switched to this phone. Um, <clears throat> I was trying to find the words to thank him for not only his mentorship, but also his advocacy and sponsorship over the past uh, eight years. 
Um, we started writing papers together when I was a medical student that had just visited UC Davis. Um, I couldn't find the words myself, but I found them on Twitter, which says a mentor's love for their trainee can be measured in tracked changes. <laughs> so Dr. Cantor, I felt very loved over the eight years I've known you. Um, it's made me a better doctor. It's made me a better researcher. Um, and your mentorship and friendship is something I hope continues uh, after I leave here. I'd like to thank my family. As most of you know, I have three children. Um, we are incredibly blessed to have four healthy grandparents. Um, they've all watched our kids at some point, as well as all of our siblings. That's just how this works. Um, this is a picture of our family just before residency started, just Phil and I and our one-year-old daughter. Um, over the years, I've really tried to involve the kids in residency and let them know what mom's been doing. This is Adelaide answering the vascular surgery service pager, my intern year. This is Pearl uh, helping me write one of my manuscripts on maternity leave. And Alex even got to come to grad school. <laughs> Our family is a lot bigger, and it looks a little different now than when we started. Uh, but it's certainly crazier, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, Phil, and I, Phil and I have been married for 15 years. And Phil, if you're listening, <laughs> It just, it takes a lot of faith to choose somebody when you're 22, and thank you for never losing faith in me. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, Dr. Farmer had a, a sign off for a different sure. meeting, but she asked me to <laughs> conclude um, and bring this to a close, but I, let's start with some questions for that. You just showed so much thing, so many things that are so spectacular. Um, the importance of a clinician being involved in this kind of work, you, you epitomize that with, uh, as much as anything, your enthusiasm for it and your ability to translate that data into data that we can understand and we find interesting and we find rewardable. So your, your, your push to have clinicians involved in this type of data resonated and it really rang true and it was quite an impressive talk. I'm happy to hear from the audience or even online if someone's online wants to speak up for questions. Tom? Dr. Farmer? Uh, Sean Adams? Sean, you have the line on. Dr. Gingrich, hi. Thank you so much. I learned a lot. <laughs> Good. Question, um, so are we ready yet for routine whole genome sequencing of, I say kids, just because that's often where things manifest, but you know, when there's these mis mysterious things going on, metabolically or otherwise, and docs just don't, can't put a finger on it, are we ready yet for the whole genome sequencing to be applied and then actually useful in any way? I think we're getting there. understand the etiology of the disease? Yeah, I think we're getting there. I think um, that risks becoming a little bit of the sort of just discovery-based approach I cautioned earlier, that you really do need to have some hypothesis as far as what you're looking for. Um, there's also kind of the, the sticking point of variants of undetermined significance and how we're sort of left explaining those to patients if we don't really know what their implications are. Um, I don't know that we're ready today, but I do not think it's far away at all. I think over the course of my career, we'll certainly be seeing that. That might be your children in the background. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> Anyone else from inside the room? Remotely, Tom, any other hands raised? Well, this is Diana. I just want to say, uh, Alicia, I put it in the chat, but let me promise you that the the best is yet to come. You have so much ahead of you in terms of, you know, an exciting personal and family life, a great a career, interesting science to develop and uh, grow with, uh, great cases coming. I think one of the fun things for all of us as our chief residents graduate is looking back on uh, how fun it is to be launched in terms of your a professional career. So. Uh, I wish you and all of your colleagues all the best uh, as you go forward in the next phase of this adventure. And of course, I have to remind you that you're not done yet. You have to work all the way to the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. 
Once again, Dr. Gendridge, thank you so very much. Terrific talk. Thank yep. you, everybody. Thanks for kicking us off. Thank you. <laughs>